um, you are more than welcome to join us at this open table Q&A webinar. Uh, my name, as you know, is Sarah Hobbs, and I'm the co-chair of trustees of the Open Table Network charity. I'm really looking forward to this Q&A tonight. One of the privileges I've found of becoming a trustee and co-chair, um, along with Alex of the o Open Table Network, has been the opportunity to work with some really inspiring people who really challenge me to kind of be more in my spiritual life than I really thought possible. And for me, um, the Open Table coordinator, Kieran um, Bowen, um, who you all will know, um, is one of those inspirational people. And being a founder member of the first Open Table community in Liverpool, and ultimately now the person leading the network, has thrust Kieran into some very amazing and interesting, as well as quite challenging um, situations. Growing up in London as part of a large Irish Catholic family, nearly becoming a priest, actually becoming a teacher, a youth worker, a chaplain, and ultimately our network coordinator. Kieran moved to Liverpool, where he now resides, um, in 2003, and he's married to the very lovely um, Warren, who is on the call tonight. I've seen Warren um, log in, so welcome, Warren. Um, if you Google this man also, you get some very, and a very interesting selection um, of responses from videos with a very with a great succession of very interesting hairdos um, to some very amazing and passionate articles and stories about issues I know he holds dear. From videos of him being interviewed by Stephen Fry um, to accounts of being the first to register a civil partnership in a place of worship in the UK. And I'm really looking forward to unpacking some of all of that as we find out what makes Kieran tick tonight. Um, so my first question um, starts, let's start right at the beginning. Um, Kieran, you were, you were raised as an Irish Catholic in London. Um, so faith must have been kind of surrounding you from a very young age. Um, what was that like? How's that, how, and how's that influenced your life um, to date? Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, really good to be with you. And it's really interesting to be on the other side of the chair because I've been doing most of these interviews in recent months. So well, interestingly, um, scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little bit of that. But uh, it's really great to be with you. And um, thank you for joining us. Um, so yeah, so I was I was born in 1970 in South London, um, and youngest of six. Irish Catholics, um, quite a large Irish community in, in where I grew up in South London. So um, lots of my parents' friends were also, you know, um, migrants from Ireland. So and majority Catholic, probably. Um, certainly in my education, primary school was a Catholic school. Secondary school was a Catholic school. I even went to a Catholic sixth form college, which was a relatively new thing at that time. So I had an entirely Christian education. Um, and um, I didn't find myself in a secular environment until I went to university. Um, and even then I kind of joined the uh, the chaplaincy. And, you know, so um, so there is a kind of fairly con consistent thread of uh, being from a faith culture, maybe not always, um, you know, really active in belief or practice, but certainly a, a, a strong, strongly faith influenced culture. Um, you know, so if my if my parents mentioned that someone had died, for example, they'd say, you know, God rest her soul, or, you know, it would, there, there were certain phrases that were just reflexes. It was automatically part of speech, you know, that, that that felt a bit strange to my ears because it's not a very English thing, but it's a very Irish thing. Um, and growing up, I did didn't always get it, um, but I think it, it grew on me to the point where you know. Actually, I think it's a really is a really beautiful thing. Um, I, it was a kind of a mixed mixed experiences. Really, I have you know memories of you know during the month of October. You know, all the family would be made to need to kneel down and say the rosary together, and I got told off for not saying it loudly enough, and you know ran away to the bathroom in tears, and you know, and so it's just. Uh, you know, not always a kind of positive and nurturing thing, but no, no ill will was ever intended. You know, it was just, you know, my parents were doing their very best with six of us in a small house um, and trying to kind of share the values that were important to them with us in a different culture. You know, they moved to England 55 years ago. So I was born five years after they came. So it, they were still relatively new in this country bringing up a young family so 
I didn't always appreciate that as a child, but I grew to, you know, really respect and understand the sacrifices they'd made for us. Um, I think probably one of the things that stuck with me was that um, I was baptised as a baby <clears throat> in the local Catholic church. And um, I'm told I was the first baby to be baptised during the Roman Catholic Mass in that church. So I think my mum thought that was deeply significant and possibly prophetic. That, you know, something was something was going to happen. You know, this, this that, that my card had been marked from, from a very young age. Um, and the church was called St. Matthew's, so my middle name is Matthew. So, so there was a sense of being part of a faith community from the very beginning, really, um, for better or worse. Interesting. And obviously that she was very prophetic because that, that, that actually came true. So I guess it must have been quite interesting. So given their kind of generational background and kind of where they where they kind of came from, I can't I can imagine there wasn't necessarily a positive attitude towards LGBTQIA plus people as you grew up. I was wondering if how early you kind of knew that you were gay and whether that whether your kind of background and that context made it quite difficult for you to come out at that, at that point. Well, certainly when I was living at home prior to going to university, um, I don't think I had a coherent sense of my own identity or sexuality. So it wasn't something that I was that was likely to come up from me. Um, I don't remember my parents saying a huge amount about it. I mean, obviously, you know, we're talking about my childhood was in the 70s, you know, so John John Inman was at the height of his powers. Larry Grayson, you know, these were the, 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 the role models in the public eye at the time. So not the most flattering and empowering and affirming, um, but they were entertaining. And so they were kind of maybe a little bit safe. Yeah. You know. Um, was there a point where you kind of came out, I guess, to your family and they were kind of they became aware that you were that you were gay or yes but that yes but that wasn't until uh you know till i was in my late 20s right. so i might i might unpack that a bit more later but just in terms of the kind of you know up to the age of 18 i didn't really have a sense of being gay or or i wouldn't have used that language um i had a sense of being different okay you know not not like um the typical boys in my school or neighborhood, you know, but I wouldn't have been able to put a name to it. I didn't really have that understanding of vocabulary. I think what I was aware of was maybe from priests or teachers that, um, you know, the Catholic church talks about homosexuality being unnatural. And what you don't often hear is that, um, you know, they teach that any sexual activity outside of what marriage between one man and one woman is, is unnatural. But it's not so therefore it's not just about homosexuality but you wouldn't think that from the way it was spoken about you know homosexuality seems to be a particular kind of obsession if you like um so even if it wasn't explicit from my parents i think i was picking stuff up from the community and the culture which led me to believe that my sense of difference wasn't something i was really free to talk about so having kind of i guess not necessarily come to that kind of conclusion in yourself you, you obviously one of your early kind of decisions was a decision to go for to become a priest and mm -hmm. the priesthood but you obviously decided against that in the end were these two things kind of tied together was that kind of why why in the end you decided not to go ahead with with that kind of quite quite a, a definite kind of um vocational kind of um route i guess yeah i mean there's quite a quite a story attached to that but but um in a nutshell, so um, I'd had a bit of a crisis in at at um, sixth form, you know, during A levels, and um, it was quite a dark time. And I, I, um, I kind, I kind of pulled through, and in a sense, I believed that I owed that to God, okay. that because I'd pulled through that dark time, that somehow I had to do something good with my life. Um, and I became very driven, and I thought I have to to. You know, by the time I graduate, I have to pick something good and worthy and get on with it. And um, I hadn't kind of consciously articulated that I was gay, but I did have a sense that I probably wouldn't get married. 
And so from my, the cult, the Irish Catholic culture I was from, then, you know, considering priesthood seemed like a natural choice. Mm-hmm. Um, and it certainly did, when I started talking about it, it certainly did close down questions about have you got a girlfriend, when are you going to get married? You know, so on some level I was shutting down the awkward conversations by doing something that was considered acceptable in that culture. Um, but it took me some years to be able to recognise that and articulate it. So um, I'd actually applied to teacher training college and seminary for Catholic priesthood at the same time and got offered a teacher teaching course first. So I went to do that and get some more life experience. And so I qualified and taught for two years. And then I went back to apply for the seminary. Um, and that felt like the right thing to do. Um, I believed I was in the right place. Um, and I came to understand that I was in the right place probably because it was it could be a very supportive environment. But I did again, it did lead to another crisis where um, I came to realize that that I was building this potential life commitment on some really shaky foundations. You know, I had a very negative image of myself, I had a very negative image of God, and therefore that wasn't a solid foundation on which to build. A vocation or a commitment was that kind of a growing realization or was there one point where it was kind of a, a flash of I, I can't go i can't go through with this you it know? was a growing realization and um, i was lucky to have an excellent spiritual director i also had some psychotherapy during that time um but the, my spiritual director said to me um because i was struggling and i had talked about leaving but my spiritual director said to me i i will I'll let you leave when you can tell me why you need to leave. Okay. So he didn't want me to just react and walk away in a bad mood. Yeah. Um, you know, and possibly regret uh, uh, an impulse decision. He said, if it's going to be a life changing decision, then you need to be able to articulate why. I know you're not in the Catholic Church now, but do you see that? You know, I know you have really good knowledge of a number of different kind of denominations and, and areas. Do you see that kind of changing now? Do you think there's more of a kind of a situation where actually you think that that priests who are kind of gay, because obviously they're remaining celibate, are kind of going to be more accepted. That's going to become more acceptable within within the Catholic Church. And um, I was going to ask you to stare at a crystal ball, but... Um, yeah, I don't know, because, um, because you know, within in, since, I, since I left the Catholic Church, it actually became, it got a bit worse. You know, um, Pope Benedict pu- uh, published a... A statement saying anyone with um, homosexual tendencies can't be ordained. So the fact that they're making commitments to celibacy wasn't even considered relevant. And and you know, folk who saw our Q and A with the pa- our patron Portugal Tuma might remember him talking about that. He trained for priesthood and left because of that very document. So he was in training some years after I um, was. But no, I basically um, came to. Uh, the realization that I I probably went to seminary to to do that work that I needed to do on myself to to kind of reach a more healthy awareness of myself and of God, and so I have I don't particularly regret it, um, uh, but yeah, it just was an unorthodox path to take, and so it took some time to kind of rebuild my life having having left that place. Um, well, I think the next stage of the kind of rebuild is quite interesting <clears throat> from my perspective because obviously. You know, you'd, you'd had some experience of teaching. You came to Liverpool around that time. You took up kind of, um, you know, work with young people in LGBT youth groups. And I think, you know, that's given you some quite unique insights, I think, into the development of, of you know, how young people think about kind of um, mm-hmm. LGBT kind of issues. I was wondering if you kind of, you know, how you saw over the, because you, you ran the youth group for quite a while. I wonder if you saw changes in kind of, in their kind of attitude um and and how they were perceived and whether you think that's kind of continue i know certainly for me my my children very much um hate kind of intolerance of lgbt mm. people um and i wondered if you'd seen that kind of going on within within your work within with young people yeah um very much so i mean i'd so when i moved to liverpool i planned to do a big career change you know i actually trained in journalism and website design you know it was meant to be a really radical change and what ended up happening was that I ended up with a portfolio of things and I went to see this LGBT youth group and to talk about doing a website for them and they said oh do you know anyone who wants some evening work 
And so I went from one evening a week to two to four, you know, so to half time hours to full time hours, you know, and I was there for 10 years overall. So it was an incredible experience and uh, hugely value it. In a sense, for a time, that felt like my new vocation and, and you know, like, almost like my extended family. Um, so it was a really special time. But um, I did witness a transformation during that time. You know, the group had, is believed to be the longest running LGBT youth group in the country. Um, and uh, so I started there in about 2005. And we didn't knowingly have any trans or non-binary folk um, in that group at that time but then we probably weren't asking the right questions mm -hmm. so we did a i ended up doing a major piece of work with the, the whole young people's charity that it was part of to look at how they asked questions and so instead of looking at a young person and filling in a monitoring form and because they've got a masculine name and masculine dress assuming they're male and vice versa as a feminine name and feminine dress must be female I said, well, maybe we shouldn't be making any assumptions. Maybe we should ask people how they describe their gender. And so we did. And we were amazed at the diversity of answers we got. And that produced evidence of need. And I was able then to go to our funders and say, this is a need we didn't know we had and we didn't know how to meet. So we need the resources to do it. And, and I've managed to get the funds to employ what I think was the country's first full-time trans youth worker. Um, so that was a major um, significant. The other thing was that probably the average age of people coming out um, was dropping in those 10 years. Um, so, and you know, often I'd speak, you know, would be working with young people up to the age of 25 and some of them had never come out in school, most of them probably. Whereas um, we started working with younger people um, we were getting working with 16 plus and then we had so many young people pretending to be 16 in order to come that again that was evidence of need so we ended up fundraising to do an un, a, a 13 to 16 youth group as well um so we definitely did witness that shift in and and it affected the way the the group grew so it was an incredibly inspiring and informative time for me i assume that that group wasn't church aligned so what was your attitude towards the church um, it wasn't church aligned um, and that did cause me some anxiety because I had, having left seminary, I went away from church for a while and it was during that time that I started to feel maybe drawn back to church. But, um, you know, I, having since I moved to Liverpool, I was quite open. You know, I'd um, had a few years of coming out and finding my feet and moved to Liverpool, was quite open publicly about my personal life. Um, and then I got this job that where I was effectively a professional gay, you know, I was, uh, LGBT in my, in my professional life as well. So therefore it was in the public domain. And after I'd been at the, the local Catholic church for a while, um, the priest said to me, will you join the reader's rotor? Will you be a Eucharistic minister? And I said, yes. And then I thought about it and I thought, well, actually, no, I'm not sure because I don't want disgusted of Toxteth to complain mm -hmm. and then for that ministry to be taken away from me because I'd even at that point I'd heard stories of that happening to people so I went to the priest the following week and I said I need you to know that that I'm, I'm run this LGBT youth group and at the time I was also um, on the steering group of the local LGBT Catholic group um, some of you may have heard of Quest with the national organization and I used to help run the local group so I told him and he said, yeah, it's not an issue, which was lovely for a priest to say that. But it was also a kind of don't ask, don't tell. Well, that's how I felt. It may not have been his intention, but it never really came up again. Yeah. You know, so he was saying, I'm happy for you to do this. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it didn't seem that comfortable to talk about it. I like that concept of you being a professional gay. I, I, I wonder if people need advice on how to be a proper gay then can we kind of come to you for for advice around well, that? It, it might be quite a lucrative consultancy <laughs> maybe yeah. i think so so <laughs> i want to get to my favorite part of the story so um around that time obviously you met warren and you got um you got together so can you tell us a little bit about how you met how you fell in love i'm kind of the romantic in me wants to hear this part of the story so can you talk a little bit to that please yeah, and we're le leading up to a little bit of history making as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, sure. um, 
So Warren's family was originally from Liverpool, his father's family, and he'd moved to Sydney. But then he came to, um, you know, visit Europe and do a bit of traveling. And um, he just made a decision to stay on. He, you know, had a return ticket from a one, you know, a one year trip. He just made the decision to stay on for another six months. And he just got a flat in, in the same part of Liverpool where I'm living. And I, I, I was completely oblivious to all of this. Um, um, and then I went to another LGBT Christian group that met in Liverpool city centre. I just had a falling out with a friend in Manchester and I was feeling a bit sorry for myself. And um, I was coming back from Manchester and I looked at the watch and I thought, oh, that, that group will just be having their social time now. I, I missed the communion, but I thought I'll join them for the social time. And um, uh, and so I did, and Warren was there. He'd been going to the group as well, but not at the same time as me. We hadn't okay. collided. <clears throat> and uh, we just got chatting, and we talked about how we both liked walking, and then I noticed that we were both wearing the same shoes. And not just Nike or high tech or, you know, but a specific brand called Merrill, which is very common among people who, who do, you know, lots of walking. So we actually had not the same brand, the same style, exactly identical shoes on. So it broke the ice. Um, and then uh, the group finished and everyone dispersed. And I said to the leader, can I stay behind and have a quick chat? Because I was still feeling a bit sorry for myself. And she said, oh, Never mind all that. What about Warren? <laughs> so, so um, I sincerely believe that we would have worked things out for ourselves eventually, <laughs> but we ended up with this. <laughs> um, we ended up with this, um, you know, this um, Franciscan nun matchmaking for us. <laughs> um, and so it was about a month later that we actually went on our first date, um, and that's coming up for fourteen years. Wow. wow. Um, and then, so fast forward a bit, because this is something we've mentioned in the intro and the publicity. So um, we did, um, so that was end of 2007. So end of 2009, we were in Australia visiting Warren's family. And I proposed in a restaurant uh, um, on Sydney Harbour. Um, and Warren said yes. And But we weren't in a hurry. So we planned that end of 2009, we planned to have a civil partnership in 2012. And while we were planning it, the law changed. So the Equality Act came in 2010. And as a result of the Equality Act, they started talking about whether they should allow civil partnerships in religious premises. So we'd already booked the register office for May 2012 on the Saturday. And we were going to have a blessing at a local Unitarian church on the Sunday. And then we got wind that the law might have been about to change and that, that um, we might not need to go to the register office. We could register the, the, the civil partnership in the church. Um, so we held our nerve for as long as we could. And we got to that, that window just before a civil partnership or a marriage where you have to um, declare bans in church or if, you're, if it's a civil partnership or a civil marriage, you have to have it declared at the register office. Um, and the church still hadn't got its license to register civ civil partnerships. But so we took um, we took a chance. Um, we ha had everything crossed that it was going to come through, and we cancelled the register office and said, "Well, if if it doesn't come through in time, well, we'll just have the blessing and we'll do the legal bit later." Um, but it did come through in time. I think it was just something like four or five days before um, the actual uh, Sunday. Um, it was really close, anyhow. Um, that we'd taken a leap of faith and took a risk to cancel the legal ceremony and focus just on what was happening in the church. And then they got their license and we were, and then we learned we were the first couple in the UK to register a civil partnership in a place of worship. Um, so it kind of escalated really quickly. Yeah. Uh, that that um, seemed to get a little bit of media attention when I was kind of reading back over <clears throat> before. Yeah, so because I'd done a little bit of media training when I came to Liverpool, I had colleagues who understood these things. So I thought that if we are going to get any attention, I'd like to have a say in how that works. And so a friend who teaches journalism wrote, uh, helped us put together a press release and he sent it out 
um, just as we went off on honeymoon. I had a conversation with him from Manchester Airport, um, you know, to, to sign off the press release. And so he sent it out just as we left the country. And then we ended up going back, you know, three weeks later and having some interviews when we got back. Um, so it was, it was actually really nice and it was quite surprising. Um, were you aware you know, we, of what was going on while you were on your honeymoon? Had you kind of spotted it? Or were you kind of oblivious to 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 what was happening? Um, well, some of it didn't really happen until we got back because they wanted to interview us. But yeah, I was aware of a little bit. Right, okay. But the the made the big surprises was coming back because it did go a bit viral, um, and uh, you know the the Liverpool Echo did a really lovely piece, which was great. Except I was having a bad hair day, so it's not the most <laughs> fabulous photo. Um, but they didn't tell us that they were going to sell the story on. So the Daily Mail picked up the story and did a really bad job. Um, they said it was a marriage when it clearly wasn't because marriage for same sex couples wasn't legal then. So they were really poor in the journalism. And there was lots of horrible online comments. Um, and, you know, so that wasn't pleasant. Mm. And we also had some religious homophobia around it. There was a, there was a website called protectthepope.com. Um, you know, which is just very bizarre. But um, yeah, there's a lot of um, negativity and hostility that we could have done without. That was quite hard because, you know, the people assuming they had the right to judge without knowing anything about us. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, um, just while we're on the subject, obviously on, on the marriage front, things are, are kind of still very live and still very um, kind of prescient in people's minds, I think. We've uh, virtually every one of these Q&As, we've been asked questions about kind of living in love and faith. Obviously, the Methodist Church have moved forward significantly on the on the issue recently. I was wondering where, where your thinking was on living in love and faith, where you're up to <coughs> with what the, the work of the Church of England and where, um, where they are at the moment in terms of in terms of that particular project. So living in love and faith is the Church of England's process on identity, sexuality, relationships, marriage. Um, and the Methodists have just voted to allow same-sex marriage for those churches and ministers that want to do it. So um, I was, I've was i been recently asked to comment on the Methodist process, and um, I think that the Anglican Church and other faith communities have a lot to learn from how the Methodists have done it. They've conducted their discernment, prayer, um, you know, um, and discussion with respect, with grace, with generosity, not without pain and hurt on all sides at times, but they've done it in such a way that I think it's inspirational. And I think um, that the Anglican Church could learn from that. Mm -hmm. I guess the difference is that, that um, well, obviously the Church of England is the state church, so that that's, adds a dynamic. They're also... Um, uh, they're kind of more hierarchical. The Anglican Church is more about, you know, about the bishops. You know, it gives more power to its senior leaders than the Methodist Church does. You know, so the Methodist Church has a president and a vice president who are elected every year for 12 months. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have an archbishop who's there for 10 years or however long, you know, um, in Canterbury or York, you know. So it's a very different power structure. And I think that's where the challenge of living in long faith is. Is that you know how much is it genuinely listening to people and um, enabling them to feel heard and valued and and understood? Um, I think it's better than previous processes. You know, the Methodist Church process went on since 1993. I think the Church of England process has been going on even longer than that. Mm -hmm. So some of us have felt you know we're tired of being talked about. You know, having um, people making decisions about us without us. So the good thing is that the Church of England appears to be including more of us. Um, so I'm uh, an advocate for the Diocese of Liverpool, Sarah. I know you're an advocate for the Diocese of Leeds. So we've decided that that's what we can authentically do is is to be representatives of our community within the Living in Love and Faith process, whereas we recognise that not everyone in an open table community can or should um get involved in this process because it might be an incredibly painful thing for some or maybe for many but for those of us who maybe do have a platform and, and an opportunity then I think we may have a responsibility to take that yeah certainly feels like it's been less painful than I thought it was going to be um, but I'm sure that's not the experience of everyone <laughs> no no indeed yeah yeah um, I want to get into the whole kind of open table kind of conversation but I wanted to just pause on one other aspect of 
kind of your experience before we get into um just get into that i know you've done some really been on some really interesting training recently you've done some work um you know kind of over in cory Mila where you've um you know been attended a, a training program over there and you one of the things that's really close to your heart is the whole issue of reconciliation and to me it seemed like that was a really interesting <coughs> subject that was allied to the whole living in love and faith conversation i wondered if you could talk a little bit about what was what's that experience been like what some of the key things you've you've kind of learned and how we can almost what we can learn from that in terms of trying to be part of that kind of reconciliation process i guess really yeah well it was exact exactly because of the growing ministry of open table and me feeling called to step out into the wider church that i sought this out so it was um Towards the end of 2018, I saw a course advertised called The Journey of Hope. And it was a six month, um, fully subsidized um, um, offering from six different peace and reconciliation centers, which included Corrie Mila in Northern Ireland and Coventry Cathedral. Um, and so um, we had modules at, at, that involved you know uh, all of the different centers so a great wealth of expertise and but I, I did I did have to kind of come up with a case study of what I was going to do during that time and I imagined even be before we knew what the living along faith process was going to be like you know we're talking about early 2019 I, I imagined a scenario where I was bringing a, a room full of people from diverse perspectives together to sit around a table and have a meal with a semi-structured conversation um, and it took a, a little while to get together. It wasn't until February 2020 that I actually managed to do it. And I got 12 people in a room, you know, from, you know, uh, open table folk on one end of the spectrum through to people from New Wine, the evangelical movement on the other. Um, and that was pretty extraordinary. And unfortunately, we'd only just begun that process when um, lockdowns happened and we haven't been able to meet in person since but i'm hoping that we will continue the conversation that we began and and it probably is because of that that i've ended up getting asked to be an, a, an advocate for the living love and faith process in 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 this diocese and so it i didn't do it specifically because of living in love and faith but because i've learned some skills and and brought some people together to have some some quite sensitive conversations then that's been recognized by by the diocese now and i've been able to use that um on for with and for the diocese but my primary motivation was because i recognized that open table was growing and i needed to be the one to begin with to step out in faith and 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 guide it um and i needed to build my resilience in order to be able to do that so the biggest piece of learning that i took away from that is that reconciliation starts with me okay you know that I, I need to do my best to make peace with the the things that cause me conflict, the people that cause me conflict. Mm. Not to necessarily to you know pretend that everything's okay because sometimes things aren't okay. But I need to to learn how to take care of those thoughts and feelings and and potential behaviours so that I'm not um, perpetuating a cycle of conflict. You know, so for example, one of the conversations I've had with folk in in open table communities is how to care for the the pain and anger and hurt that they've experienced and and to try not to perpetuate that mm -hmm. you know so so many of us know what it's like to be dehumanized because of our gender or sexuality so i encourage people to explore ways of caring for that which doesn't involve demonizing and dehumanizing evangelicals or conservative christians or pentecostals or whoever in return because that's just perpetuating the same cycle of of dehumanizing it doesn't serve any of us it just entrenches our positions and keeps us stuck where we are um so that has been the biggest learning for me and i think that's something that i seek to model for the open table communities yeah no, i think that's really wise advice uh, so let's get into open table um it's obviously a big part of why we're all here tonight and I'm assuming that most people kind of know the story of Open Table. But <coughs> give us a really quick minute or two on on kind of you know what does it mean to you? How has it come about? Just tell us a little bit of the story if you can. Yep. So I mentioned earlier I was part of an LGBT Catholic group um, 
around about 2007, 2008, when I first met Warren. Um, Warren was involved in the parish where Open Table began. Um, and I started getting curious about what was going on there. So we went to some things together. One of them was a group called Changing Attitude, which was a, an Anglican campaigning group. But they said, yeah, let's do some worship together. But it wasn't just Anglicans in the group. There was like four different Christian traditions. And one of the uh, women there said, will it be Open Table? And as a Roman Catholic from a tradition that doesn't practice Open Table, I had no idea what that meant. And she said, it means um, all are welcome to Christ's table without test of worthiness or membership or, or you know, no condition. And I was really delighted and excited about that. And, and I said, yeah, I think that's what we should call it because that's a statement of our intention. And that's how it got its name. So I don't take credit for setting up Open Table. It wasn't my idea. But I do take credit for the name because I got so excited about that question that, that um, you know, my kind of media background, the tra training I'd done in, in commun um, journalism and stuff suggested to me that that was really what we needed to do. Um, it's quite changed over the years. So how, since that kind of very early point, so how, tell us a little bit about that kind of that journey that it's been on. Well, I mean, the campaigning group would set it up folded after 18 months and, and we could have just stopped at that point. But that was another leap of faith. You know, um, Warren was given a set of keys by the rector of the church and said, you'll open up and make the coffee, won't you? Um, and, you know, so he's ended up taking the lead on the Liverpool community. And I used to co-facilitate with him until, you know, 2015, when people started saying, how fascinating, let's do that in Warrington or Manchester or North Wales. And um, so between summer 2015 and summer 2016, suddenly we had four communities. And then we've added about three a year since then, and we've currently got 18 active communities. So it regularly blows my mind about how it's evolved. And, you know, we seem to be having another peak in interest at the moment where we've, you know, we had six new inquiries last month. So if you'd have said to me like 13 years ago that, you know, you'll, you'll be running the charity, um, which is a network of all these communities, I would have just thought you were insane. Um, so I'm completely amazed at uh, how it's unfolded and it still seems to have tremendous potential that we've only just begun to realise. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's kind of, um, I guess, a lot of really amazing and very inspirational people have been folded into its its work, which is just so exciting, really exciting. Um, I know we've, we've got a question that we've been asked um, that I'm going to fold into um, the next question I wanted to ask you, which is I know that recently we've conducted a piece of research talking to kind of members, leaders, partners, all kind of talking about where where now, where do we go from, <coughs> from here um, in terms of um, the Open Table Network? So I was wondering if you could tell us what some of the key things that came out of that research and kind of where do you see it going in the future? What do you think, you know, what's your kind of, in the words of, of Mel, what's your kind of hope and radical longing for Open Table in its next steps and in the future? Oh, I like that phrase, radical longing. Yeah. So for those who may not have seen it, you can download this from the website. I prepared earlier. <laughs> it's uh, our research and case for support. And um, so we, well, basically we'd heard lots of stories. I knew that there was a need for this, but I, I wasn't always able to say how because it was just anecdotes really. So we needed, a, we needed some evidence to say to people who might support us, this is why we do it and this is what we need. So, um, so from the members and the members of our open table communities, um, more than half said being LGBTQA plus is a barrier to belonging in a faith community. Um, and we asked the leaders and volunteers, um, who run the groups, um, if being in a, being a Christian was a barrier to belonging in an, in an LGBTQIA community for their members. And about half of the leaders and volunteers said, yes, it was. So that was clearly the need. Um, but the research showed that 92% said being in an open table community increased their sense of belonging. And 97% said being part of an open table community contributed to an improvement in their lives. So that I mean, I kind of knew uh, on an instinctual level, but to actually have an overwhelming endorsement for the difference it's making to people was really humbling and touching, um, massively encouraging that, that maybe this is greater than the sum of its parts, you know, that something is going on here. 
Um, I certainly believe that it wouldn't have grown in the way it's grown if the spirit wasn't moving in it. Yeah. I, you, some some folk may have heard me say before that this is not my kingdom I'm building, mm-hmm. you know, because it wouldn't be so uh, abundant and and impactful if it were. And I'm aware that some critics from the conservative end might say that this was us pushing on our agenda. I really don't believe it's so. Um, so this really gives me a substantial case to go yeah. to um, secular funders or church funders and say, this is the difference this is making. And, you know, LGBT people are marginalized by church communities. Um, and, you know, sometimes uh, people feel that coming out as Christian is a challenge in a, in a, in the wider LGBT community as well. So that, and and the members have told us what it is they'd like to see. So they'd like to see training for, um, uh, for churches and other institutions that want to understand the issues of our communities better. They'd like to see more retreats, um, you know, more communities to reach more isolated people, you know, so those are some of the big takeaways that, that our members are asking for. And that's what I, as the coordinator and, and Sarah, you as co-chair and, and the rest of the trustees are, t- are hoping to take forward over the next three years or so. Yeah. I'm following up on another question that's been asked. Do you think that, you know, are we, is there, do you think there should be things we should be planning around kind of um, equipping young queer people to lead within the context of, of Open Table and helping them to find their place in our, in our future development? Oh yeah, very much so. I mean, as um, Sarah, you'll know, but for the wider community we want you to know that we are having conversations about well who are we reaching and who are we not reaching and you know so we recognize that in some communities young young people are not well represented there's also you know people from minority ethnic communities um you know um people who are minorities within the lgbtqa plus community maybe are not always well represented in our community so we're very mindful of that um, and uh, and so yes, definitely, we're committed to empowering LGBTQA plus people of all backgrounds, but particularly young people who may not always feel seen or heard, and other minorities within our communities as well. Yeah, we've created a space for um, LGBTQIA plus people because there wasn't necessarily a safe space for them to go. Is there a danger that that could actually become almost a spiritual ghetto? Do you think that people should be part of another church in their local community too what what's the relationship between um o- open table network and the local church how do you see that working well um i have had that question about whether we're creating a spiritual ghetto and why do lgbt plus people need a separate space i get that question a lot and it's usually well meant it's just curious or a lack of awareness sometimes it's not so well meant And so I've reflected on it and I sometimes reflect the question back to people and say, well, do you see the need for, you know, the Mother's Union or the Women's Institute or Dementia Friendly Church or Message Church? And they usually say yes. They can usually see that there's a particular community with a particular need. So and my argument is that it's no different. And so sometimes there's an underlying assumption that you know, well, why Why do you need to have a separate space? There's a lack of awareness or understanding. Sometimes it's ignorance, sometimes it might be prejudice. So I do try and unpack that with people because I don't believe we're creating a spiritual ghetto at all, nor should we. I think there's been uh, predecessors to Open Table, like the Metropolitan Community Church that came over here from America. They were pretty much an L- a predominantly LGBT space that was mainly a sanctuary for hurt people and they weren't necessarily empowering people to go out into the wider church. So I reckon that about half of the folk that come to Open Table are part of other faith communities and are more feel more seen and heard and empowered in Open Table than they do in the wider church. And half are probably people who've left church for, for various reasons and found Open Table to be their way back. So there definitely is a relationship. And they, I wouldn't say to anyone, you should go yeah. anywhere. But... Um, it's our goal that people would feel enabled to to bring the whole self to to the wider church life, not just to the open table community. Do you think we should be welcoming people from non Christian faiths into open table into the open table network? It's a question that's been asked in the um... yeah yeah. Well, I mean, it has happened. I mean, there's um, 
I, mean, I can remember a particularly poignant moment. There's an um, someone in, um, who's come to the liberal community a number of times who's a practicing Buddhist now and an artist and has painted an altar frontal for the Liverpool community. It's a beautiful piece of art that he gifted to the open table community in Liverpool. Um, and he has come and received communion and been really moved by the experience. So, I mean, we're already ecumenical and, you know, that means that we're, we're re including people from a number of different traditions. So we're not set. We don't often say the creed in our services and that, you know, we're not telling people what to believe is happening. What we're saying is this table is open. This is the central act of hospitality of the Christian faith. It, it's remembering Jesus' last meal with his friends and what that self-giving love of Jesus teaches us. So I believe that's something to, got to say to all of us. It's part of the best of human nature. Yeah. Um, and if people from other faith traditions find that ex accessible and want to come and hear more, then they're more than welcome. Um, we're not saying that people should be excluded because they might have a different understanding of what's happening yeah. because that might include some people within the Christian community as well, if we did. Yeah, completely. Yeah, um, totally agree with that. Um, so we know that kind of there are lots of people who think that being LGBTQIA plus is sinful. Um, you know, we a lot of people talk about um, talk about it in terms of in a marriage of they're not being able to get past you know it's about one man one woman kind of mm. being that's the only right context for this so how do you reconcile your faith and your sexuality when sometimes some people would see those two things as necessarily being in conflict with each other um well i did experience that conflict myself for many years and that's what contributed to my kind of periods of distress in my earlier life but um well, I had the good fortune to, you know, to study a bit of moral theology um, uh, in my training. And there's a there's an understanding in moral theology called an informed conscience, where, you know, it's actually part of maturing in faith. You don't just do as you're told because you were told it by a teacher or a priest or whoever. You actually develop an informed conscience. You You read, you listen, you learn, you pray, you reflect, and you make a positive choice and you make a commitment for yourself as an adult. And so that's a concept that's well understood in the history of the Christian faith, and particularly in Roman Catholicism. It's not often talked about, though. It's much, the ch Christian church has much more of an impression of the church that likes to say no. You know, and so um, I did have a moment where I was on retreat, and it was um, in an early stage of my relationship with Warren, where I actually did have the negative voices in my head saying, am I doing the right thing? Should we, should we part, you know? Um, and I, I, you know, I was on a silent retreat and I did go really deeply with that. And um, I picked up a book in the bookshop, which, and I opened it on the page and on, and the question that I saw on the page was, what do I do if I disagree with my church community? And um, that was a, that felt prophetic to me. That was one of the most concrete answers to prayer I've ever had yeah. because it was speaking into that idea of that I, I as an adult and maturing in my faith need to make my own choice. Mm -hmm. And what the church calls unnatural is unnatural for heterosexuals, yeah. but, I, but I'm not. And therefore what's unnatural for them might be natural for me and vice versa. And so I, I actually came to the understanding that as long as I'm, respectful of others and myself then i don't believe i'm doing anything wrong yeah yeah absolutely that's yeah a really good answer the one thing i do need to check is warren was aware that you had those thoughts wasn't he have we ever yeah yeah yeah, yeah i mean yeah absolutely i mean <laughs> of course we the interview <laughs> well no no i mean yeah i mean we've both told our own stories and little bits of each <laughs> other's stories a number of times um no, I mean it's been it's been necessary and important and good for us to be able to talk about our own faith journeys. Um, I think if we hadn't, then we wouldn't be able to create spaces for other people to do so. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. One of the things I know is important to a lot of people on the call and in general, the people who are going to listen to this recording is the whole subject of mental health. 
And I know this is something you've really been very open about as well. And I really am grateful for your willingness to be open about this because it's, you know, it's not an easy topic for everyone to um, to talk about. And I know you've struggled over, over time with this. So what kind of stuff do you do to help keep yourself in a good place, given that, you know, I suspect in your in your role, you know, there are neg- there's negativity being thrown at you a lot that could actually <clears throat> drag you down. How do you make sure you keep kind of in a men- mentally in a, in a really good place um, and keep healthy? Um, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think I've I've learned a lot from from my journey, and you know, I've sought out mentors, you know, spiritual directors, counselors, that kind of thing who've who've supported me so i do still have a spiritual director now um uh, so i've for most of my adult life you know from that kind of dark period i talked about when i was 18 i've sought out um uh, you know had to have what at least one significant person in my life with whom i can talk honestly yeah. um and so i i really notice the lack of that if i don't have it yeah um sometimes I resist it, you know, so, um, so in terms of my spiritual life, prayer life, you know, it's a bit like, um, other things that I know are good for me. You know, I know that doing lots of exercise and having a healthy diet is good for me. I don't always keep up with it and I don't always remember to pray every day or, or, you know, what, you know, or meditate or whatever. I know those things are good for me and, um, and I'm better for it when I do them. So, so a big part of my self care is actually, to try and see, have a healthy self-discipline and to say, yeah, I might not feel like um, going for a walk or I might not feel like meditating or whatever, but actually I know that I will feel better um, and I will kind of be able to focus on what's life-giving more if I do those things that are good for me. Yeah, yeah. I guess some people do find it quite difficult to kind of find people to kind of reach out to and to have the kind of, the confidence to do that how have you kind of have you found that easy straightforward is that is that something that you know people have just crossed your path what, what i think for me it's about it's been about necessity you know that i was i was at breaking point a couple of times you know so i really did need to do something different if i wasn't gonna be completely broken by the, the experience but um but i think in terms of 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 how I've then able been able to be there for others. I think the experience I've had have given me empathy. So at my when I'm at my best, it's given gives me huge empathy for other people, and so I try to off to be that pe- person for others where I can. Yeah. But also to recognise my own limitations. So I'm not superhuman and I can't do it for everybody. Yeah. But this is where um, you know empowering folk within Open Table might help that they can be the listening ear for someone else that we can pay it forward if if i if i've been a role model for someone else then maybe i can help someone else to feel like be a role model for others or that we recognize that as open table we can't be all things to all people and we sign posts to other services mm-hmm. like spiritual direction or counseling or other support groups for particular needs mm-hmm. there's almost kind of a sense of i think you know asking for help when you don't need you don't need it need it is actually that proactivity means that at the point where you really need help and you don't know you you know it's really hard at that point to cry out for that that actually you've yeah. already got that support in place i guess yeah that's right um, there was a, another question that come in saying if you're happy to share this is there one significant glimpse of god's glory that, op- that open table has shown you i can't it's really hard to pinpoint one moment because it keeps happening wow yeah fantastic um you know i mean from you know well, I've been. I've spoken to more than a hundred churches about yeah. this. So there's clearly a hunger for this, both from people needing this and people wanting to offer it. And and I'm I'm constantly reminded of that. Yeah, you know, you've you've sat around, sat down with people who disagree with you, exclude you, and you want to sit at an open table with them. I wondered, how do you do that when you know that they're not necessarily supporters of you, but you still show them that kind of that you're open to the dialogue and open to um to have conversations at an open table i think we've touched on it to begin with with the question about reconciliation earlier on but it's also important to say that it's not 
always possible. It's not, not everybody can do this and not everybody can do it all the time. There are days when I couldn't do it because it wouldn't be good for my mental health to do so, you know, and so I recognize it's not for everyone. But it's about finding common ground, you know, um, recognizing that we've got more in common than makes us different, you know, that we're all human beings. And hopefully in the context of things like the Methodist and Anglican conversations around um, identity and marriage that, you know, we're all Christians and we may have different ways of expressing that, but actually we are, we have got more in common than makes us different. Mm -hmm. But, but also to remember in the Christian context that Jesus prayed, you know, may they all be one, but he didn't say one and the same. So we are going to be different and we are going to disagree and there may be tensions and maybe conflict. Mm -hmm. Um, So, um, I mean, one of I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna quote Padraig Tuma because it's one of my favorite lines. You know, in response as well, I was I was hoping you would. In response to that, the same question, Padraig Tuma said, "Love the gospel, but take no shit." <laughs> and so we are we are not called to be doormats. Yeah. You know, and there will be times when you know, I mean, in 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 answering the question, what would Jesus do? Sometimes throwing. The tables over is a legitimate option, but it's a last resort. You know, it's we're not called to do that every day. Things could get messy. Um, we are actually called to, you know, love our neighbour and 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 challengingly to do good to those that might hurt us. Yeah. But I think that's about not dehumanising them in return. Yeah. You know. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my final question, which I uh, I love asking, is if you could sit around a table with anyone. Who would it be that you would sit around the table with? Um, well, um, t- well, typically people come up with famous names, so I'll do a couple of those, but then I'll come up with a more likely scenario after that. I think. So, my I had the opportunity of visiting my brother who worked in South Africa for a while. So I would love to have a conversation with Nelson Mandela. He did some amazing work. Around, there was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, in in South Africa, that was an incredibly prophetic thing. So I'd love to know more about that. And Peter Tatchell's another, um, you know, uh, human rights activist, particularly around LGBT, um, but not exclusively. Um, he was Australian. Um, he's had a hugely prophetic journey. Um, a secular person, but who values, you know, people's freedom of religion as well. Um, so slightly less well known, but there's um, Karen Armstrong was a former nun. And she's created something called the Charter for Compassion, which is an interfaith, humanist, a really diverse way of being the best humans we can be. So if you haven't heard of the Charter for Compassion, I recommend that. And then there's an American author called Brené Brown, who's done loads of work around shame, which is an incredibly toxic thing in our communities. We've been taught to be ashamed of ourselves. She's a sociologist who's studied the impact of shame and she's her work is amazing. But probably more plausible than any of that is the, the seven folk we've got to be our patrons as Open Table Network. So I probably won't get those other four people around a table, but we might just stand a chance of getting those seven patrons around a table. So I'd settle for that. That would be an amazing, amazing, amazing meal. That would just be, I'd love to be uh, attend it or be a fly on the wall, one or the other. Um, Kieran, I want to say thank you so much. Um, you've We've covered so much across the course of this conversation and it's been really, really appreciated. Thank you for your candour and your honesty um, and your openness in our in our discussions. So next month, our Q&A is going to be a chance to um, have another conversation, um, but this time with um, Alex Claire Young, who has been on our chat tonight, and me. We are in conversation um, together. Obviously, most of you will know Alex. Alex is a theologian, writer, campaigner, United Reformed minister, and minister to an online community called Chespacious. As a trans masculine non-binary person, Alex is passionate about advocating for the inclusion of and the social social justice for trans people. And their first book, Transgender Christian Human, was published in 2019. A very amazing book. I reviewed it on our website. It's really worth a, worth a read. Um, for, for me, I'm... Um, I'm the MD of a, of a small consultancy supporting lots of large organizations to help identify and release the talents of their employees. And I've spoken at lots of conferences and, and really helped a lot of people to kind of fulfill their potential. I came out as transgender <laughs> in 2019. 
2017 and started my process um, from that point. So Alex and I are really looking forward to having some really interesting um, conversations um, next month. So it would be lovely if you were able to join us on the 24th of August. So Tuesday, the 24th of August between 7 and 8 p.m. for an hour of reflection, insight, and hopefully some responses to your questions um, live on Zoom. Okay. So I think that takes us to the end, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and for staying with us throughout. Hopefully you found um, the, the topic um, really interesting. You've got some more insight into A, Kieran and B, um, the Open Table Network. And we really hope that you are around and willing and able to join us um, next month. And we really look forward to, um, to seeing you. Um, very, very soon. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Good night. Go well.